Walk through any woodland in Britain and you'll no doubt be able to pick out the forest celebrities. Think ash, oak and pine, among many others. But a healthy forest is full of a diverse range of woodland trees, each with their own legends and folklore. They do also have party tricks that see them give back to the forest community in their own particular ways as well. Some provide for early pollinators, some support huge ranges of insects and some even actually improve soil fertility. So let's find out more about three woodland trees native to these shores, alder, silver birch and blackthorn, in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I do hope you're well. I hope that you enjoyed our return to the forest and slightly more traditional fare, I think, last week with the folklore of some woodland plants. I was really pleased to see how much love primroses got after that particular episode, which is cool, and how many people were like, Oh, Lily of the Valley's poisonous. Who knew? So yeah, hopefully you'll get some fun little takeaways from this episode as well. And it was really funny because I've got so many tree episodes already. I was like, ah, what else can I do? So I've ended up picking three that are actually native to the British Isles. And that was kind of more by accident than anything else. But I thought, well, we'll just stick with three because there are tons of other trees that I could have picked as well. So as I said in the introduction, we are going to be looking at alder, silver birch and blackthorn. Because a couple of them do appear in the Victorian language of flowers, I won't be doing my this episode is brought to you Sesame Street style by bit because there's already a couple in here. So it's sort of built in really. So we're just going to jump right in because that's how these things work. And we're going to start with alder or ulnus glutinosa. Now this is actually also known as common alder, black alder and European alder. And it's part of the Betulaceae family. Like I said, it is native to the British Isles, but it does also appear across most of continental Europe, as well as North, Central and South America. Alders love damp, cool or moist ground, so you often find them in wet woodlands or beside rivers and lakes. They produce catkins between February and April, and alders produce both male and female flowers on the same tree. You can tell the difference because the yellow long catkins are male, while the rounded green catkins are female. Now, it can be easy to confuse them with hazel trees, but the one way to tell them apart is that the alder has shiny leaves and hazel leaves are actually slightly fuzzy. Now, alder trees do have a fun party trick, and I did mention this in the introduction, because they can actually improve the soil fertility around them. And that's because there's a particular bacterium, Frankia alni, which forms lumps on its roots. Now, these lumps actually absorb nitrogen, which the tree then uses, and in return, the alder gives the bacteria carbon. And obviously that's one of those kind of things where when they do then break down or when the leaves break down, obviously all of that lovely nitrogen then goes back into the soil again. Now, Alder does have another party trick, and that is actually the wood's resistance to decay. So both Amsterdam and Venice have piles underneath them. And obviously, like in particular, you think Venice, it does look like it's just sitting on nothing. And it's not. It's sitting on these piles made out of alder wood. And the wood actually hardens underwater. One article said that the wood almost turns to the closest you could get to stone without using stone. So obviously, they're quite happily sitting on these piles, which are fine as long as they're left in situ because the only downside is the fact that if you then expose the waterlogged wood to air it rots really quickly so as long as it's kept wet it's fine. Now in myth and folklore the alder is linked with Bran in the Mabinogi and when Bran sets off to rescue his sister Branwen he and his men discover that Branwen's husband has had the only bridge across the river Cleon dismantled and Bran lies across the river to act as a bridge. Now, Joe Wolfe actually theorises that that might suggest the natural link between alder and water. And in another folktale, which kind of again hints at this link, an alder tree stands beside an old holy well. A farmer is there and he's cutting the branches of the tree, and while he does so, he sees his cottage on fire. He hurries home, but then finds, hang on, the cottage is fine, there's no problem. So, a little bit confused, he goes back to the tree and then goes back to his work cutting its branches. He looks up and he sees his cottage on fire for a second time. So he rushes home and again, his cottage is fine. 
So when the vision happens a third time, the farmer decides to completely ignore it. And when he returns home, he finds only smoking ashes instead of his cottage. Now, some people think that that's got some more to do with the link between alder and fire. But I think the very fact that the alder tree stand next to a holy well does also suggest that we may have to consider, was there a water spirit involved in this? And if so, how? Now, in the past, the alder was known as the tree of war because its sap is dark red and resembles blood. I would also say on top of that, that alder was actually a favoured wood for shield making. And apparently they have actually found huge alder wood shields from the Bronze Age in Ireland. So it's also entirely possible that its warlike connotations also come from a more practical sense and not just because it's got like sap that makes the tree look like it's bleeding. In Ireland, it was considered unlucky to pass the alder if you were on a journey. And given alder trees liked water, they often grew near bogs and people thought that evil spirits lived among them. Again, that's one of the things that to me sounds like a bit of a cautionary tale that obviously if you're a traveller on your own, you don't really want to be going wandering in a boggy terrain. So staying away from alders would be a really good way to stay on slightly more solid ground. And in Somerset, travellers actually avoided going into alder copses at night, worrying that they would never be seen again. And there were also some really interesting Scottish stories in which the fairies would take humans and then actually leave alder logs in their place. So in one story, people buried a bridegroom that they thought had died, except he then returns to tell the bride he's actually still alive and the fairies have him. Somehow, although the story doesn't explain how, the people do manage to rescue him and when they open his tomb, they find an alder log in his place rather than him. So it's really interesting to come across that one because I've come across it before, but in relation to oak trees that oak logs would be left in place of a human that people would see as being the person, but then when the enchantment's broken, people realise it's just a log. So it's quite cool to see that in association with alder as well. Now, alder does have various other uses as well, and one remedy claims that you could put alder leaves in your shoes and it would stop them from getting sore during a long walk. Now, that might come from the fact that alder was once the preferred wood for clog making, or there may be other things behind that as well. According to some legends, fairies dyed their clothes using alder so humans couldn't see them. Now, you can actually make fabric dye from the twigs, flowers and bark, so that is one that you could try yourself. And there was also a theory that Robin Hood himself used the green dye from alder flowers to dye his clothes. Whether that means that Robin Hood is actually a fairy and was doing that to make sure people couldn't see him or not, I don't know. But that is quite an interesting kind of crossover fan fiction waiting to happen. People put dried alder leaves into cushions to soothe rheumatism and the fresh leaves apparently also repel insects, which might be worth knowing as we start coming into the spring. Its bark boasts antibacterial properties, so people would make decoctions with the bark to help heal wounds. And on a slightly less practical note, apparently if you made a whistle from alder wood, you could summon the wind and you could also use such whistles to help get benevolent water spirits to help you as well. Again, I'm assuming that's because of the link between water and alder. Although quite interestingly, Fender apparently use alder for their guitar bodies. So I would be quite interested to know if you were playing a Stratocaster alongside water, would that get any spirits on site? I don't know, but I feel like that is something that somebody needs to try. But meanwhile, in Ireland, people would actually make milking pails from alder wood to help protect the milk. So it's interesting how you've got this idea of protecting milk, probably from the fairies, I'm guessing, by making a pail from alder wood, but then the fairies leave an alder in place of people. So again, I think it's quite interesting how these different woods and trees and things do kind of show up in different ways across different stories. But we're going to move on to the birch. Now, specifically the silver birch, but it's a bit difficult because there's actually two types that you'll find in Britain. So you've got the Betula pendula, which is the silver birch, and you've also got the Betula pubescens, which is the downy birch. And they're both native to the British Isles and they quite like dry woodlands and heaths. And they are, they're also both part of the Betulaceae family, like the alder. But I think more of the folklore tends to relate to the silver birch. But it's just, it's quite difficult to know because sometimes it just is birch and doesn't specify. Now, it is quite an eye-catching tree if you come across them in woodlands. And I think most of that comes down to both the pale wood and the knots that look a lot like eyes. So birch trees always look like they're glaring at you or just watching what you're doing. And they never seem particularly impressed by what you're doing either. Now, pre-Raphaelite artist John Everett Millay actually used one to good effect in his painting The Knight Errant, in which a naked woman is tied to a birch tree in the forest. Now, birches are one of Britain's oldest native trees because they were one of the first to move northwards after the last ice age, but also their pollen usually triggers the first hay fever of the year as well, so they're not everybody's favourite tree. 
That being said, they do provide both habitat and food for over 300 types of insects, so they're really important to any woodland ecosystem. Now, the birch also has a party trick, and this one comes about because they've got quite widely spread roots, so they can reach otherwise inaccessible nutrients. So the tree can then take these nutrients in, and then when it sheds its leaves in, sort of towards the autumn, it deposits those nutrients back into the soil. So silver birch is a really good choice for improving soil quality. Some people swear by a birch leaf infusion for rheumatism, gout and kidney stones. And its sap can also be made into wine or sugar, which is apparently lower in calories than regular sugar. And apparently the sap is also supposed to be good at clearing up UTIs and cystitis. Now the wood burns even when damp, which makes it a good choice for firewood. And its bark can be used for tanning. And apparently poet John Clare actually used the peeling birch bark as substitute paper, which is quite cool. Now, in the past, the silver birch has also been called the white birch, weeping birch and ladies birch. And in Canada, poet Pauline Johnson wrote about the silver birch while recollecting the forests of her First Nation ancestors and the name stuck. And I do think silver birch kind of suits them much better than the other names. But how do they appear in folklore? Well, I'm glad you asked, as this is a folklore podcast. But the birch trees mark the border between the worlds. Now, which worlds exactly is not always clear. So, for example, in The Wife of Usher's Well, a mother sends her three sons to sea. Having done so, she realises her error and spends the remainder of her life hoping that they'll return home. Eventually, they do return in the winter with their hats of the birk. Obviously, birk being another word for birch. Now, it does seem that the boys have returned from the dead to visit their mother, which is evidenced by the reference to birch, because in Ireland, people once carried the dead to their grave covered in birch twigs, so there does seem to be a link between birch and the dead. Of course, this otherworldly nature of birch makes it ideal for the traditional besom. So while a broom handle is usually made from hazel, the sticks are birch branches because obviously they're so delightfully flexible. Except here's something to get your head around. If birch could apparently drive away malevolent spirits, why was it a common material in the witch's broom? I'll leave you to think about that one. But there are quite a lot of links between birch and fertility as well, and people apparently burned birch kindling to welcome spring's first sunrise. And farmers might also herd barren cows with birch switches to encourage pregnancy, and if you did the same thing with a fertile cow, it would lead to a healthy calf. I'm not sure the cow would necessarily enjoy either of those treatments, but there you go. People might also put dried birch leaves in a sick child's crib to help encourage a return to health. In Herefordshire, people would dress young birch trees in red and white ribbons and then prop them against stable doors on May Day. And they were actually left in place all year to ward off bad luck. And apparently it stopped fairies or witches from coming into the stables and then hag riding the horses. A little part of me wonders if they wrap the ribbons round in such a way that they then look like a barber's pole. But that's probably my brain just going off in weird directions. People in the Hebrides apparently hung birch over cradles to protect infants. And in Wales, people might make the cradle itself from birch. Now, birch trees ended up with various love connotations. So in Irish Gaelic poetry, birch might be called Finvain na Colour or the Fair Woman of the Woods. In Wales, the lover's bower traditionally lay under birch trees. And if a boy gave a girl a birch twig, it meant his love was constant. Now, the birch was a popular choice for maypoles in places like England, Wales, Germany and France. Whereas in Sweden, boys would carry birch trees around their village on May Eve while singing songs. And in Cheshire, you might fix a birch tree over your sweetheart's door on May Day. And according to Mrs. Berg's Language of Flowers Dictionary, birch meant meekness, which does seem like a little bit of a weird choice considering all of the protective stuff it could apparently do and related to fertility as well. But there we go. And speaking of its protective nature, people would hang birch twigs and garlands with rowan, cowslips and may blossom over the kneading troughs in the kitchen to stop bread being heavy. In Ireland, birch could ward off fairies who didn't like the wood, and you could also protect your milk from bewitchment by twining a birch catkin into a cord and putting it under the milk pail, although you could also just make the milk pail out of alder wood and then you basically have sort of double the protection. Now its protective nature also appears in a Scottish story in which a phantom horseman tries to drag a man to hell. The man hangs onto a birch sapling until first light and is thus spared. There was also a belief that anyone sheltering under a birch tree wouldn't be struck by lightning, but please, please, please don't try that one at home. And finally, the birch does have somewhat unfortunate connotations with punishment through the use of its boughs to whip people in days gone by. Now, in ancient Rome, a bunch of birch rods and a ceremonial axe became the symbol of judicial authority. And that's where you might have seen this symbol, because it does still appear now and then, where you have like an axe and then it's literally got the rods around the handle. 
and this is known as the fascis, and that's ultimately where the word fascism comes from. But do bear in mind that it was an important symbol for French revolutionaries because the twigs represented power for ordinary people and strength in numbers. It's also part of the National Guard's insignia in the US and it's above the door of the Oval Office. So it's quite interesting how the birch trees ended up with quite a weird variety of meanings, I think. But we're going to move on to Blackthorn, which I'm going to be honest, is my personal favourite of the three. I mean, all three of these grow near where I live, but the Blackthorn in particular is quite a showy plant and I absolutely love it. Now, its botanical name is Prunus spinosa and it's native to the British Isles as well. And it's part of the Rosaceae family. So it is a cousin of the rose bush. Now, it does grow in Europe and Western Asia, as well as Eastern North America and New Zealand. And it's commonly found in woodland, copses and hedges. And Blackthorn can grow up to four metres in height, but it nearly always forms shrubs instead. Now, in the winter, it is easier to spot because it's got black twigs, hence the name. And sometimes it can be difficult to tell apart from hawthorn, but there are three main ways to identify it. So first of all, it actually flowers in March and April, well before hawthorn, which is usually around about the May mark. And in the past, blackthorn blossom has actually appeared during a cold snap, which is called a blackthorn winter. And if there isn't a black metal band called blackthorn winter by now, there absolutely should be. And it's also tied to a farming saying, which is, when the slow tree is as white as a sheet, sow your barley, whether it be dry or wet. No, it doesn't quite rhyme, but it's just the idea that obviously if you sow your barley when the blackthorn tree is covered in white blossom, you basically need to do that regardless of the weather. So we've got when it actually flowers. Secondly, blackthorn is quite unusual because it actually flowers well before the leaves appear. So if you see a plant that looks a bit like hawthorn, and it's got blossom but no leaves, it's more likely to be blackthorn. Whereas obviously on hawthorn, you get the leaves first. Thirdly, you can tell these apart really easily. The berries on the blackthorn are blue-black rather than the distinctive red haws of the hawthorn. And the fact that it flowers early makes it a great tree for early pollinators, and that's kind of its special party trick, the fact that it comes out so early. Now, on the downside, it's Really quite vicious thorns do provide a somewhat unpleasant service for the red-backed shrike and these birds catch smaller birds or rodents and then impale them on the thorns ready to eat later. And anyone who's of the same generation as me would probably have been absolutely traumatised by that sequence in the Animals of Farthing Wood cartoon when a shrike was then just picking off the mice and voles that were part of the party going looking for a safer life somewhere else. And I, I, once you see that, you can't unsee it and I don't really think that that should have actually been aimed at kids but there we go. In folk remedies, people used to use blackthorn to make syrups or tonics from the bark, fruit and flowers, and this could apparently soothe rheumatism and digestive complaints, although you're more likely to come across the berries now being used to make slow gin. And according to Mrs Burke's Language of Flowers dictionary, blackthorn meant difficulty. Now, most of the stuff about blackthorn in the folklore, apart from the fact that you can use it for quite a lot of stuff, does end up being quite evil. So in some legends, witches would use blackthorn wood to make their wands or staffs. People would fear any suspected witches who use blackthorn walking sticks because apparently there was a belief that if a witch pointed one of these blackthorn sticks at a pregnant woman, it would cause a miscarriage. There was a chap named Major Weir who was a covenanter and a vowed witch, or at least he confessed that he was. And this was sort of back in the 17th century and the authorities burned him in Edinburgh in April 1670, but they took great care to burn his blackthorn stick with him. And some people believed that to be the source of his powers. Some people claim that Christ's crown of thorns was made of blackthorn, which again adds to its evil reputation. And some people believe that if you took it into the house, it meant that death would follow. And there was a German belief that claimed blackthorns grew wherever heathen blood was spilled in battle. There's also a bit of an odd one that people claimed hawthorns and blackthorns were locked in this bitter rivalry and hawthorns would kill any blackthorns growing near them, which I must admit the blackthorn that I know literally grows right next to a hawthorn and they seem to get on fine. But much like Hawthorne, people didn't bring blackthorn blossom inside the house and especially not into church. Now, there was one caveat here where you were allowed to bring blackthorn in, but it wasn't when it was blossoming. Instead, people would bring it in in Ireland to sweep chimneys. So you could basically use a smallish blackthorn brush to sweep all the soot out and things like that. But it's not all bad. I mean, obviously, I think blackthorns do kind of make up for it a little bit with some of the nice things that they can do. But by tradition, Kent's Mayor of Sandwich actually carries a blackthorn staff to ward off witches and a new one is made for each new mayor. And I find that absolutely hilarious that people thought that witches use blackthorn staffs to do their ill, but then you've got a blackthorn staff used to ward off witchcraft. 
and its wood was also traditionally used just for generally for walking sticks and also Irish shillelaghs as well. Now it does appear in a love divination although not necessarily a positive one because in Wales people would make blackthorn thorns into pins and then throw them into wells and if they sank their love was being insincere. And blackthorn does appear in a farming fertility ritual in Herefordshire and Worcestershire. So on New Year's morning, farmers would take down the wreath of blackthorn twigs that had been hanging in the kitchen all year and they would hold it in the fire until it was scorched. And then they would take it to the wheat fields, burn it in the furrows and then scatter the ashes over the first wheat. And this was believed to drive the devil from the fields. The women of the house would then make a new wreath of blackthorn to hang in the kitchen until the following New Year's morning. So I think, again, that's probably the only other time when people would actually have blackthorn in the house. And even then, it's not the blossom, it's just the wood, which is probably why that's allowed, but not the flowers. And in one Irish story, a woman kept being bothered by a shadow every night. She went to see a wise woman to see what she could do about it. And the wise woman told her to sprinkle holy water around her house and keep a blackthorn stick by her bed. The woman did exactly as she was told and never saw the shadow again. And finally, one Irish story told of a man whose corn had been stolen and he fell asleep under a blackthorn bush and and dreamt that the fairies had his corn. A voice told him how to get it back. The farmer then followed the voice's advice and managed to retrieve the corn. But unfortunately, the fairies had one last laugh because the corn then killed any livestock that ate it. So ultimately, what do we actually make of these woodland trees? Well, one of the things I find really interesting about these three particular trees is the way that all of them obviously do enrich their environment. It's a little bit clearer to see with the alder and the birch tree, whereas the blackthorn tends to only really benefit animals and insects and so on that may want to use the tree. Whereas it's kind of got a lot of evil associations that the other two maybe don't have. But then at the same time, the alder is associated with war. Birch trees are then associated with punishment and then the blackthorns associated with witchcraft. So they're kind of almost like the more interesting trees of the forest where you've got you know the really flashy ones like rowan which can ward off witches and you've got the oak tree which is associated with jupiter and so on and then you've got the ash tree which can do various different bits and pieces and then you suddenly get these three it is it does just show the absolute variety of folklore associated with trees and i think for these three in particular the very fact that they're all native to the British Isles means that so many stories have grown up around them because of the fact that people have been so familiar with them. But what I find really interesting is the way that all of them also have uses. So you can use one to make walking sticks, you can use one to make maypoles out of, and you can use another one to make children's cradles and milk pails and things out of. So even the trees that we've got a little bit of a funny feeling towards if we were to see them in a copse or have one grown on the property or whatever you still find a use for them anyway. So it's kind of like people have got almost grudging respect, particularly for the blackthorn, but you still have an awareness of their use. So they're not completely pointless to have around. And as always, I do think it's really important that we bear in mind the actual ecological benefits of these trees. So we're not just looking at them as as examples of folklore, but we're also looking at what information was coded into the folklore that might be useful but also just having an awareness of treasuring these trees, because even if we can't get any use out of them, it doesn't mean that animals and other plants and so on don't. So I'm a big fan of all three of them, but particularly the blackthorn, because that one I think is kind of the most heavy metal of the three, and they are really beautiful when they're in bloom as well. And if you go on the blog post that's associated with this, and obviously I've got loads of photos and videos of the blackthorn near me, because it's my absolute favourite. But I hope that you enjoyed that. Next week, we are going to be doing fungi, which somebody asked for ages and ages ago. And now I finally got some books about it because it's a lot more difficult to find fungi folklore than I thought it was going to be. But there we go. So, yeah, that's all good. And this is also my last call for the Fabulous Folklore Turns 5 competition. Yes, that was actually in the middle of January, but I thought I'd give you one final week. So I am going to be closing entries on the 17th of February. So if you do want to enter the competition, all you have to do is just tell me, like, do you have a favourite episode? What platform do you listen on? And what kind of content do you like? And there's just the three questions in the Google form that's linked in the show notes below. And then I'm just going to pick someone at random to win the prize and obviously you can find more details about that at the link in the show notes also on the 22nd of february i am doing a talk with the last tuesday society on the folklore and myths and legends and so on of the british highwaymen so why do we often still believe the myth particularly about someone like dick turpin and ignore the actual history instead why why does that happen what is the actual history that's what we're going to be having a look at so tickets are available and that's also linked in the show notes as well 
But anyway, this has gone on to be a little bit longer than I was expecting because I've just fangirled about three trees at you. So I do apologise about that. But I will see you next week when we have a look at fungi folklore. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.